Good evening. Uh, this is Dr. Tom Putnam, superintendent of the Penfield Central School District. And I welcome everybody to the Penfield Central School District community meeting number two uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. And uh, we'll get started here um, with just some quick introductions. Uh, I, to save some time, I won't introduce people by name, but wanted to say uh, that the members of members of our Penfield Central School District School Board are here with us, as well as members of the Penfield Central School District Administration, uh, both district level and building level. And I thank them very much all for being here this evening. Our agenda this evening is pretty straightforward. There'll be some opening remarks, very brief for me. And then we'll go through um, a number of slides that are and that will, will respond to the previously submitted questions. Um, and then we'll have some time for new questions. If you went to the web page we sent out uh, that you are watching this on, there is a form you can fill out to submit a question and we will see those in real time and uh, try to answer as many of those as we can if they are questions that we're not answering during the uh, previously submitted question portion. And then we'll just have a uh, very brief closing remarks. For my opening remarks, I just really wanted uh, to say thank you. Uh, one to our school board who's been, has been absolutely wonderful through this process. Uh, none of us want to do anything but bring kids back five days a week with no masks and pretend that COVID isn't happening. Um, but we are in the, the land, in the world of this reality, and we have to make sure that we meet all mandated guidance from the New York State Governor, the New York State Department of Health, the Monroe County Department of Health, and the New York State Education Department. That uh, guidance is not a recommendation. It's required, and we must meet it. And this school board has been working through um, to be extremely supportive and also ask very difficult questions, which uh, I do appreciate because it pushes our thinking and making sure that we're doing everything to the best of our ability. I also want to say thank you to our administration that's here uh, who have worked tirelessly 24 hours a day since the guidance came out and before to make sure that our plan uh, is supporting all needs of our students and staff. And then just a thank you to um, our community. Uh, first of all, our school community, we uh, employ just under a thousand people here in the Penfield Central School District, and they have been incredibly supportive along the way. And then to the parents and guardians and students who may be watching, uh, thank you very much. We, uh, the, board, the school board has a goal of partnerships, and this is um, no uh, truer than we're living in right now. This partnership is critical. In order to run a hybrid program, we're going to have to partner with families, and we understand the impact that this has. So just want you to know from the board, from the district, uh, from everybody in the Penfield Central School District, we acknowledge these frustrations and the anxiety of a new school year under um, the reality of COVID and guidance that we have to follow. And we, we acknowledge it, we feel it too. And, and we are very hopeful and know that if we work together as partners, we can get through this and do best for kids. So as we look at these questions and go through, I just want to say also a thank you to Sharon Erkitz, my assistant here, who uh, spent a long time all uh, last night and today working to gather the over 1,350 questions we've received from approximately 500 community members who um, went through and, and really organized these. The questions you're going to see tonight are questions that have been asked um, typically more than once. And therefore, we are going to really spend some time going through these. If you tuned in for the 3 to 5 p.m., these are the same questions we're going to go through. But at the end, we will go through any of the new questions that came in. Um, so health and safety. Um, a lot of health and safety questions, and which makes sense, and all of them are great. Uh, these questions here, are children expected to be tested before school begins? What about staff and teachers? Do they have to be tested for COVID before school begins? The, the short answer is no. Um, we are following all of the required and recommended guidance. And right now there is not a plan in uh, Monroe County schools or statewide to test students or staff before they return to work. Um, and if that changes out of the Department of Health, we will meet that obligation. But as of now, that is not an obligation that we're required to or have the ability at this point to require testing of everybody before they return to school. Um, what will the COVID protocols, uh, what will the uh, protocol students have to follow while attending school and will they have temperature checks? So just out of the gate, the six foot guidance is critical. 
in order to meet the guidance, we have to make sure that all of our students in the classroom are six feet apart from each other. And therefore we are requiring masks, which is a, a, a relatively new um, strong recommendation from the Monroe County Department of Health. So in terms of protocols, it's wearing masks, it's being a socially six foot distance whenever possible. And the temperature checks, it's not just temperature checks, but if we talk about students, the requirement is that they have their temperature check once a day and then regularly answer the COVID-19 wellness questions. Those are the questions you've seen if you've gone to a hairstylist or a barber, you've gone anywhere where they ask about five questions on, on how you're feeling and whether you have a, a temperature. So the Monroe County Department of Health is really clear that we cannot do this alone. There's no way we can bring 4,000 to 4,600 students in our doors every day and guarantee a temperature check before they enter the building or bus. So the recommendation from the Monroe County Department of Health is that we partner with parents and guardians, and that partnership is going to be critical. So our staff is going to be using an app designed by Frontline, a company that we use for lots of things, and they will do the wellness questions and a temperature check um, every day before coming to work. We're gonna be utilizing the same frontline app for our students. That app will go to parents and they will um, be asked to complete the wellness questions and temperature check every day for their children. If they don't fill it out, uh, we will be notified through the app and then we'll have to pull students um, out of class to take their temperature. The, the magic number uh, based on the guidance is above 100.4 and you cannot be in school. So uh, we really are gonna ask more information is gonna be sent directly to parents and we'll show you how the app works and, and talk about this because it's critical that we get those checks done before students arrive in school because in a hybrid model, the vast majority of our kids are only gonna be going to school real time for two days. And we don't wanna waste any of that having to call kids down to do temperature checks. So more on that, uh, that process will be coming out from the school. Um, what happens with a positive case in children or teachers? And can we explain what will happen if a student or teacher tests positive for COVID? Um, this is a, a question that we all have as parents, as, as educators. Um, and the answer really is here, we are going to be working very closely with the Department of Health for every positive case that may arise. So there's not always a clear answer that if there's a positive case, exactly what will happen. We're partnered with the Department of Health for contact tracing, and based on their guidance, we will have to follow what the Department of Health tells us. So it's possible a positive test could result in a class or an individual being quarantined for 10 to 14 days. I use this as an example uh, that, I, that I'm borrowing from an administrator that shared this with me earlier today, is that if we have to call the fire department because of an issue with uh, a fire or smoke in the building, as soon as the fire marshal shows up, they're in charge. They'll tell us what to do, whether we need to evacuate or whether we're okay staying in the building. The Department of Health is like the fire department in this situation. They are the experts on COVID, they are the experts on the guidance, and they will tell us who needs to quarantine and what needs to happen. So we are working very closely with them as we go through this process. Lots of questions came through around the need to quarantine, uh, whether students and staff would need to be tested before returning to school. Do they get clearance from their doctor? Will a positive case immediately shut down a class, a building, or the entire district? Will families be notified of a positive case in our contact tracing plan? As I mentioned, all of this is uh, really comes out as a strong partnership with our Monroe County Department of Health. So um, as superintendent or as a school official, we cannot quarantine anybody. It comes from the Department of Health that if there's a positive COVID test, that person would be quarantined for 14 days. With contact tracing, the people that they have had um, long-term exposure around, the Department of Health will notify them that they need to quote, um, quarantine, and they will also notify us. So it's possible that a third grade class with a positive test of COVID may have to quarantine for 10 to 14 days, but that would come from the Department of Health. If they did, we will have a plan in place. We will reach out to families. The question around whether we'll notify people, we already have this practice in place, 
around other illnesses like pertussis, the whooping cough, and strep throat. If you've been in Penfield schools, you probably have received a letter that somebody in your child's class tested positive for strep throat at the elementary school or for pertussis uh, whooping cough. The same process will be used here with COVID. If there's a positive test, we will be sharing with the school that there was a positive test and what action the Department of Health is telling us to take. Um, we won't be sharing names. This is still HIPAA protected information. We won't be sharing who, you know, who tested positive or, or, or where they may have been um, exposed but we will share everything we can along with the Department of Health information. If a child is sent home with COVID symptoms, like a cough or a fever of 100.5, uh, 100, uh, 100. um, uh, do they need a medical note to come back? Will they need to also get a COVID test? This is a question that is a uh, possibly going to change and we're continuing to monitor the guidance. As of right now, our understanding is that if a student it um, a student has symptoms, they will have to go home and uh, will have to see their uh, pediatrician or primary care physician. Um, and then based on the medical history of that student, we'll either be able to come back because they know it's not COVID or they may be recommended to get a COVID test before returning. So as we continue to dig into this guidance, we will let families know what is the requirement. But as of now, if a student goes home because they have um, a low grade fever and GI symptoms, and the doctor knows that that student has a intestinal issue that arises many times and turns on a low grade fever, it's very possible that the doctor's okay will bring the child back to school without having to get a COVID test. Again, that direction will come from the Monroe County Department of Health. And if anything changes with that process, we will inform the entire community. Given that a significant proportion of individuals with COVID are asymptomatic, how are temperature screenings and attestations going to keep the virus out of school? I wanna be very honest and transparent. There is nothing we can do to keep a virus out of our school. And we know that because of a flu season that comes every year. So our, our role really here is to make sure we follow all guidance from the Department of Health. And that guidance requires us to do temperature screenings and have people fill out the wellness questions for COVID. So will that mean a student with COVID or a staff member won't enter the building? No, it's possible that could happen, but everything we can do to mitigate risk, we can't eliminate risk, but we can definitely put everything in place to lower the risk factors for our building. Our teachers and staff receiving extra training regarding how to identify and help students who are struggling with emotional mental health due to COVID. The answer here is yes. First of all, by the guidance that is required, all staff have to be get some level of training on the symptoms for COVID and what to look for. And then thanks to this Board of Education and their vision for the last, over the last 10 years, a focus on the wellness of all children and social emotional learning um, we will continue to work with our staff around um, keeping an eye out and um, being ready to support all of our students when it comes to the emotional and mental health, especially around living in a pandemic. This is um, really, as we've all heard, unprecedented times, and we, um, you know, we are working together to make sure that all students feel comfortable. If you as a parent feel like your child um, is, is struggling, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out to the classroom teacher the administrator, and especially our incredible mental health teams of counselors and, and psychologists and social workers. We are here to support all students' needs. What type of changes have been made with the HVAC filtration in order to meet the guidelines and, and have these guidelines been modified for COVID? Well, the other question is, is plexiglass shields covering students' desks happening? I'm gonna talk about plexiglass shields first. And the, the, and the overall answer is no. When you walk into a, one of our classrooms, you are not gonna see plexiglass um, cubicles everywhere. You may see them in some special area classes like our 1213 or where our speech pathologists are working with students, but the vast majority of our building will not be covered in plexiglass um, cubicles. The um, uh, air filtration system, I wanna be very honest, is that we have an incredible director of facilities, uh, um, Alan McNiff, who was on at the five, uh, three to five piece that we are gonna record and put up. If you wanna hear directly from our director of facilities, I would watch that and, and, and get to that question. But I will give you the short answer, which is everything that we're doing meets or exceeds those guidelines for our filtration systems. 
We are um, really cranking them up to make sure that the air exchange is at max capacity. So we'll be bringing in more fresh air all day long beyond what we're required to do uh, for typical guidance. We'll also be keeping windows open whenever possible and making sure that we get all that fresh air into the building and our filters are gonna be changed and they'll be changed uh, throughout the year to make sure we're doing everything possible uh, to follow that guidance. Um, there was already a bus driver shortage and a substitute teacher shortage before COVID. What do staffing levels look like for the coming year? Um, right now, staffing levels look okay. But if you go to our webpage, we are hiring people, especially bus drivers. So if you know anybody, please have them apply. Um, but we will continue posting positions as they come available. Right now, staffing looks good. We can open. Will there be adequate coverage for classes as staff teachers need to quarantine, stay home due to illness? Uh, we're going to run into an issue we know where, where a staff may need to go home for quarantine and we'll need to find a substitute in order to, in order to go through uh, the year. Um, we're going to monitor that closely, but absolutely uh, students will not be left in a classroom without an adult and, and hopefully every single time a certified teacher. Um, but that is something that we're monitoring very closely to make sure that we can um, um, stay open and, and do what we need to do to support students. Um, I got this question a few times and I think it's great. What is the Board of Education's role with respect to COVID-19? Officially, based on all the plans, the school board does not have to approve the plans for COVID-19. However, we have a really strong commitment in this district of our school board working very closely with the superintendent as well as district and building level administration. So everything that we're doing, all of our plans, all of the decisions, I keep the board uh, in the loop and close to. And as I mentioned earlier in my opening, they, they um, have been extremely supportive, but they also question and also, and also push for deeper answers sometimes, which I appreciate. It's exactly what they should be doing as an elected body. And uh, they are also always open to email feedback. So if you have a, a question and you'd like to email to the board, their uh, professional emails are on the um, district website under the board tab. Lots of questions around masking. So I'm not gonna read through these questions, but I'm just gonna use it as a guide to talk through our masks. When we originally created our plan, our, our unofficial draft plan, we talked about masks being required in some areas like common spaces, but not being required in the classroom. Based on feedback from and recommendations from the Monroe County Department of Health and also other districts in the area, we shifted to require masks at all times in the building and on our buses. Really, it's about being safe first. Let's be as safe as we can first, and then hopefully this year, COVID will dwindle away and we'll be able to maybe open up some things and change some procedures. But we're gonna start school as safely as we can by requiring masks for all staff and students, even when the six foot distance can be maintained. Um, children not wearing masks due to medical exemptions, that is possible. We do know that there are some students who may have a medical exemption that um, requires them not to wear a mask. However, in talking with the Monroe County Department of Health and our district physician, uh, Dr. Tu, we do believe too is that those um, exemptions are 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 not should not be that um, should not be that um, there shouldn't be that many. So we really know that we're talking about people who truly have a medical reason not to wear a mask, not that they're uncomfortable or they don't like them. And so anybody that uh, gets to not wear a mask will have to have medical documentation that will be reviewed by our incredible school nurses as well as our district physician, Doctor Two, and when necessary, the Department of Health. Please describe mask breaks. So we are we know that wearing a mask for our students all day is gonna be very new and very different, especially our youngest primary students. But we are going to have mask breaks at the elementary level. They'll be a little bit more scheduled. We'll make sure we try to have some fun with it. We'll make sure that we understand that this is the new normal. We'll be doing some teaching around the mask and why they're important but we definitely will have organized scheduled mass breaks uh, so students can take them off when that six foot distance can be maintained. As we get older to the secondary levels, we will still have some um, planned mass breaks, but also allow the student that if they are in that six foot distance away from everybody, they may be able to take mass breaks on their own. And we'll work through that in, as a classroom and make sure that students as well as our staff get a break from wearing a mask all day. Um, 
The other, the other piece around here is will students be required to wear a mask during PE, recess, choir, buses? And the short answer to this is yes, that masks will be, will be worn at all times. There are some activities where like PE, where students are 12 feet apart, the mask can be removed. Same with some of our band and orchestra that'll be able to perform at our secondary levels. So that is possible, but again, it's gonna fall back to what the teacher says and what the district says, the school building. So there are times when 12 feet of distance in a classroom such as PE can take place, the mask would be able to come off. Our policy on masks for our younger learners, I sort of talked through, it's going to be a lot of training and a lot of work. We'll share some documents with all of our parents as well to help you work with your children between now and the start of school on wearing a mask. If they refuse to wear one, or regardless of the grade level, we really have some, some process already in place around our school dress code. Um, it's Penfield, we have amazing kids thanks to amazing parents, and if we really run into an issue where a child is refusing to wear a mask, it would be a conversation in the classroom. It would then probably go to an administrator to have a conversation about the importance. If it still isn't working and they're not wearing a mask, parents would be contacted. And at an end result, if we have a student who's refusing to wear a mask, we do have to maintain the safety of everybody else in the building and in that classroom. So if it's not a medical exemption, they just don't want to wear it, then we do have a 100% virtual option, which we will probably talk about. Because what we less than we want is to put out discipline or a suspension or anything like that because of a mask. We are offering a 100% virtual option for families that would like to select that, and that might be a conversation. But I'm really on the, on the side of positivity with this. And I think of our dress code. Uh, almost always, we have students who, once they understand and their families partner with us, that we can take a, a maybe a bad choice and, and make it much more positive. Um, will the school provide face masks, face shields? We are providing face masks to every student and staff member. We are gonna have at least two that we can share. Um, we are also encouraging all staff and students to use their own. There is no mandate right now for what type of mask. Um, between the 3 to 5 p.m. and right now, the 7 to 9 p.m. meeting, there are some conversations about maybe the Department of Health sharing out best practice types of masks. But right now, as long as it covers the mouth and the nose, that is what we're asking for. We've seen some really cool masks out there. Students can wear their own mask. And, uh, but if not, we will have one provided. We'll also have disposable masks on school buses and in the, and in the buildings for that student who might have a mask but forgets it one day. How will wearing a mask be enforced? We sort of talked about that. And we talked about the second question here is that what would happen if they if they never wore a mask? If it's possible we'd be talking with a parent about moving to the 100% virtual model. Our school is providing hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes for students. Um, do parents need to, to, to provide them? Uh, we are gonna have a hand sanitizer um, in all classrooms, in the hallway, we'll, we'll take care of that. Obviously, if families wanna send in hand sanitizer for their child, they can do that as well. There will be hand sanitizing stations all throughout the buildings and we'll have the hand sanitizer pumps in the classrooms. Will there be hand washing breaks with actual soap and water? Yes, we haven't talked officially about that, but at our K-5 level where there is a, a, a sink in the classroom, it's uh, very feasible. We already do that now with hand washing. As we get to secondary level uh, without sinks in the classroom, it's gonna be on students um, to, to make sure they're washing their hands. And we have lots of signage that will be up about that. Will paper towels be provided instead of hand dryers? Yes, we did a really good job uh, environmentally getting rid of all of those paper towel dispensers over the last five years. And now by regulation, we can't use hand dryers. So we are now installing paper, paper towel uh, um, uh, things in every, in every bathroom. So yes, there will be paper towels provided instead of hand dryers. What cleaning solutions are being used to sanitize the classroom and buildings? If you go to the three to five film and watch that, Alan McNiff, our director of facilities, gives a really good answer. But I will give you my short answer that everything we're using is approved by the New York State facilities. So, so we're following all the regulation. All the chemicals we use have to be um, okay to use and approved to use in a school setting. So that, that's what we'll be using. We don't use, for example, straight bleach to clean something. We can't do that. But everything we're using is school safe and appropriate. And um, if you go back and early, Mr. McNiff goes a little bit more in detail. What special training has the custodial staff received? 
Are there enough custodial staff? Is the district hiring professional companies to clean? Right now, we have an incredible buildings and grounds facility. If you've ever walked through our buildings, you've seen our facilities, they, they're spotless. I'm always amazed when people visit Penfield, they talk about how clean our schools are, and that's because of that team. So we are not at the moment hiring any professional companies to come in. We're doing it all in-house. We've bought new tools. We've bought new uh, supplies, and we are uh, cleaning those classrooms and buildings, and we'll be doing that all year. Uh, there is training in terms of all the new equipment that custodians have used. They're, they're trained on that. And uh, is there enough custodial staff? Yes, there is. But keep an eye out on our HR site because we're always hiring like all school districts do. And if you know anybody who wants to work with us as a custodian or cleaner, uh, please have them reach out. How is the room disinfected before the next group comes in? And who's responsible? Four classrooms where the kids will be coming in and out, yes, they will be sanitized uh, in between classes. It will be the adult responsibility. By regulation in the guidance, we cannot require students to sanitize their own desks, but we will make sure and we'll be training our adults to do that. If kids switch rooms, how will the cleaning of supplies be handled? So you'll see uh, when we put our supply lists out, we, we're really going to try the best to not have students sharing supplies as much as a typical school year. But we do know that there's going to be times where students may use a scissors and another student wants to use the same scissors. So that's why we're having hand sanitizer. That's why we're Purelling. Um, and again, it goes back to not being able to eliminate risk but really mitigating risk the best of our ability to make sure that things are sanitized for students to use. Um, what are the bus cleaning and safety practices? Our bus drivers, as all of our students, are wearing masks. Um, the drivers, while they are driving the bus, may be able to pull their masks down because of sight. And if you wear glasses, sometimes it can fog up. But at every pickup and drop off, the driver will be wearing a mask, as will all students. On our school buses, uh, students have to sit one to a seat. Except for families or households that live together, they can sit together on a bus. And for cleaning, in between each run, our drivers will be sanitizing the seats and everything that people touch. So we are going to be sanitizing um, much more uh, frequently. Instead of just at the end of the day where they'll get a deeper clean, we'll be sanitizing um, after every run. So talking about transportation, we have some transportation questions. If you choose busing, um, on, the, on the survey that we put out, we asked people if they were going to need a bus or if they were going to drive their child. So if you said you were going to drive your child and then circumstances change and you need a bus, that's okay. We put that out for us just so we can get an idea of the number of people riding. But we are routing every kid as if they need a bus because we know in Penfield that circumstances change. And while I might hope to drive my child every day, there might be a day I can't and they need the bus. So once we're able to put the bus routes out, you'll be able to go into Infinite Campus like past years and see where the bus stop is and what time the pickup and drop off is. Um, what will the drop off and pickup times for parents be? And will, uh, so right now it's gonna be the same as, as past years. And so um, the process for pickup and drop off when parents and guardians are driving will be shared with you by building principals because it's different for all six of our buildings. And we'll share that information. Right now, we're not changing our pickup and drop off times. Uh, we're going to monitor that all year, but especially the first two days of school. We know more people are going to be driving, but we also know half of the student will be attending each day. And so with half of the students attending, even if there's more people driving, we're, we want to see what it looks like before we make massive changes to pick up and drop off. So we're going to monitor the first two days of school, and you'll hear from your building principal if a change needs to be made on time or location of pick up and drop off. If high school students uh, get have to get dropped off before work, can they go somewhere? And yes, yeah, same with Bay Trail in the high school. The doors may open a little bit before the class starts. Um, students will be able to go to the cafeteria, the library, and, as, and sit socially distant and wear a mask and be okay um, before the class starts. When dropping off kindergartners, are parents required to walk the children into school or class? And the answer is no. Um, just like a traditional year, when the kindergartners get dropped off at school, we have a really nice pick uh, drop off spot. You'll see it. The principal will share how it works. Um, but the parents stay in their car and the kindergartner or any grade level um, walks into the building. 
Will each school consider a staggered pickup drop-off time? As I mentioned, we're going to monitor that throughout the year, especially that first couple of weeks of school. Um, and if we make changes, you'll hear directly from your building principal. What's considered a reasonable amount of time for a parent or student to be waiting during parent pickup or drop-off? That's a great question. As a parent, I've dropped off and picked up my children, and sometimes the wait is really long during a typical year. So I'm just gonna ask that we are all as patient as possible, especially the first few weeks of school, knowing that it's going to take a little longer possibly to drop off and wait to pick up your child if you're driving, which is why we're also scheduling every student for a bus if they need to ride it. How many students will be on each bus? I talked about this, it's about um, one to a seat. And so with families sitting together, there are times that our school buses hold up to 60 students. That's three to a seat, all seats filled. With our routing right now, even if everybody rode the bus, we're probably at about 30. We know that we're gonna be down closer to 20 to 22 once the parents who are driving start driving their children. So we do know that the guidance for school buses is different than the guidance for the classroom. You are required to wear a mask, but social distance is to the best of our ability. So that's why that mask is critically important on the bus. Students might be a little closer than six feet in some situations, but wearing the mask is what is, is the mandate we uh, have put forth. How will transportation work for our urban suburban students? And will the high school still be provided a late bus that leaves at 250? So our urban suburban students are Penfield students. So everything that pertains to our students uh, who live in Penfield is the same thing. So the cohorts were split and they'll still receive the bus transportation from the Rochester City School in our district. And uh, those buses will have about a half as many students on them. There will not be a late bus for urban suburban students or any student. We are not running late buses or having any extracurricular activities in person in any of our buildings to start the year. That's one of those areas where potentially we might be able to open up and hold after school activities based on the recommendations from the Department of Health. But in the beginning of the year, um, there will be no late buses. Students will need to leave at the end of the day. Will there be transportation to EMCC programs like New Vision? Yes, if your child at the high school is in an EMCC program, they will still receive transportation to those programs. Will large crowds of kids gather as they're walking into the school? It's possible when we have to try to bring in at this this year at the high school about 750 students. Um, and so it's possible there's only really one door to come through. And uh, that's why the masks are required. We'll do our best to be socially distant, but we encourage parents as well to have that conversation about with their own children about um, trying to separate the best we can. Again, that's why the masks are going to be mandated. Now we get to a new topic of instructional models. So really we've got two models that we're able to offer students. I wanna just take a mention in a second, but we've got, I'm gonna first talk about virtual, 100% virtual, and then the hybrid model. Before I do that, I just wanna talk a little bit about an overarching question. Why is there no space to accommodate learning in person five days a week? I just wanna talk very briefly about this, is that across Monroe County, you will see that um, all high schools are hybrid and most middle schools are hybrid, but there are many districts that were able to find room for K-5 to go to school five days a week. And that is because although we all have to follow the same state mandated guidance, our buildings and our districts all look a little different. Penfield is pretty obvious right now why we need space. We're currently in three major construction projects to build four new classrooms at each of three of our elementary schools, so 12 classrooms total. The reason we're there, and we've talked about this for many years before that vote got passed and we started construction, is we really maxed out our buildings. So many of our buildings don't have computer labs at the elementary school, we turn them back into classrooms. Places where um, teachers might meet with a small group of students have been turned back into a classroom. So we do not have the space at our elementaries to do social distance in the classroom and bring everybody back. My, my simple math explanation is this. A typical elementary school classroom in our district holds 12 students if we have to put six feet all the way around them. A typical average class size in Penfield, because we need more space, is about 24. So to make sure that I can have six feet of distance around every child in a classroom, 
our each classroom of 24 would have to be split into two separate classrooms. There, we don't have 24 extra spaces that I can use as a classroom in our elementary schools right now. And there are a number of districts in our same spot that have been growing in spaces truly limited. So the other piece is, so what about outdoor space? We have lots of outdoor space here in Penfield. Why don't we build a temporary structure like a, like a tent that you might go to for a wedding? And um, I would tell you this, is that any space we use that's not already a classroom has to be approved by the New York State Facilities Department. And there are really tough regulations. You have to make sure that all of the fire safety is there, that the air handlers are there, that you have lit paths, that it's uh, accessible um, for people with disabilities. So there's a long list. It's not as easy as just putting a, a party tent up and having a class there. We actually looked at a while back with our class size issue of maybe buying trailers, like, like those temporary classrooms. And because of all the safety pieces that have to be in there, they can actually cost upwards of $900,000. Just to go get a trailer is inexpensive. To get one that you can legally use as a classroom is, is very expensive. So ultimately, that is not an option that is long-term enough. If we knew we were gonna be able to open fully five days a week with all kids in on October 1st, maybe. But we don't know how long this is gonna be. And speaking of October, it's Rochester, it's probably going to snow and an outside tent is not going to be a good place to learn when there's snow on the ground. But I think these are great questions and really important that the community knows all the questions you've sent to us along the way, we dig into, we look at that, we want to bring kids back, but ultimately at the end of the day, we can't with the guidance provided to us. So let's talk a little bit about 100% virtual and what it will look like. If my child does 100% virtual, will it be the same quality level of instruction that's expected for the students that go to the hybrid model? This question is truly at the core of us building a hybrid version and a virtual version of the school day, because the answer is without a doubt, yes. If your child's in the virtual model, they will, be, they will have the same curriculum the same, based on the same standards, the use of the same assessments. And by the end of the school year, they will have been taught and learned what they need to for that grade level. So it will not be a different level of education. It will be looking different, but our focus will make sure that if you pick hybrid or you pick virtual, you're getting a grade A Penfield Central School District um, program. So for the virtual model, will it be more than Wednesday for direct contact with teachers? And I can say, yes, if you're doing the virtual model, we have some plans I'll talk about in a minute that we are really building to make sure that there is much more interaction with our, um, our virtual students because they're not coming into school at all. So they have opportunities to meet with their virtual teachers. Will teachers Zoom and teach in person at the same time? This is a great question. We've really looked into this with our director of technology and with the abilities we have. It would actually be a really nice thing if our district said, when you're at home, you're just gonna turn on your computer and zoom into the classroom. And that sounds great, but in practice, it doesn't work. We have a couple of directors on tonight who've been trying to run professional development all summer with half of the teachers real time and half of the teachers online via Zoom. It doesn't work well. The people on Zoom can't hear everything that's happening in the classroom, the people in the classroom may not be able to hear the people on Zoom. So we are not, uh, our plan does not include having teachers teach a class and students just Zooming in. That would be really extremely difficult and not good instructional practice because the teacher is not gonna be able to engage online learners at the same time they're engaging in-person learners. And so that is not an option for us right now. I will say there may be some opportunity to do that, for example, in a resource room with students with disabilities who have resource room where there's only two students in the resource room at one time and one student zooming in. Something like that might be possible, but at the grand scheme of a classroom, full classroom, that it's, it's not a sound instructional practice that we're looking at. If things change, this is something that might change as we enter the school year, but starting out, that's not an option. For virtual learning, will teachers have a class via Zoom? Yes, so if students are taking virtual, they will be meeting with their teachers on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, which is another approved Penfield Central School District platform for uh, video conferencing. With the 100% remote have the option for students to participate in math and reading RTI? This is a, a K-5 question. 
So right now, and, and this is new information we shared first at the three to five, and so if any of the administrators or board members are on now, it'll be new to you, um, is that we really are getting ready to finalize the hiring of virtual only teachers K through five. And so what would happen is we'll be looking at hiring potentially some of our own teachers to, to leave the traditional hybrid classroom and be a virtual teacher. They'll still come to work. They'll still be working out of, uh, of a building, but that allows that virtual classroom to have a virtual teacher and meet much more synchronously than trying to do it all asynchronous. And so the way I look at this is how a couple districts I just learned are doing, they're actually calling it something. They're calling it a virtual academy. And so if you look at this, we have four elementary schools in our district. The virtual students, based on the numbers we have right now, would be from all four elementary schools. And, and a Penfield Central School District teacher would be their virtual teacher. So it's sort of like having five elementary schools, four that will be running hybrid and one that will be strictly virtual. So can those students then jump into the RTI that's happening the other two days? I will say it's possible, but it's a scheduling issue we need to work out because on those other two days, we have kids coming in the hybrid that are in person. And then two days at K-5, they're learning from the literacy and math specialist and the enrichment teachers, but they're not learning review, they're learning new content. And so we have to find a way to schedule our virtual students into the new content of RTI as we go through. But right now, what I can tell you is K-5, we're committed to having a virtual teacher that you have real-time connection to because you're unable to come into school and have real-time connection with the teacher. What will 100% Learner's Day look like? Will it be like the home instruction provided in the spring? As a superintendent and a parent, I will say absolutely not. We have to do something different. The spring closure was an emergency closure where everybody was working from home. This is something we've been planning for. And so this will look more like a traditional school day. So during the school day, students will follow their schedule. On the at-home days, they will be scheduled on, at K-5, they will be scheduled into Zoom that they will be joining. And at the secondary level, they will have asynchronous learning assignments that they have to get on and complete each day that they're um, virtual. For the fully remote elementary option, will kids be participating along with the other hybrid students on Wednesdays or in a separate group? Right now, it's a separate group. And that may not always be the best answer, but trying to be as transparent so parents can plan. Our goal is to have a full-time virtual teacher, perhaps for each grade level. And so on Wednesdays, when we do SEL check-ins at the elementary, we want them to check in with the virtual teacher because the SEL needs Social emotional needs for a hybrid student might look really different for a virtual student because that virtual student may not be getting out of the house all that much. They might be at home a lot more often due to medical needs and the reason for a virtual. So those SEL needs might be a little different than a person in hybrid and we want them to feel a connection to the classroom. For the fully remote elementary option, roughly how much time will the children be expected to sit in front of a screen? At elementary, we're looking at about two to three hours, and it may be scheduled so it's broken up a little bit, but uh, it won't be a six-hour day that, uh, that a kindergartner has to sit through. We're looking at about two to three hours based on grade level. How often will they be able to Zoom Q&A time with their teachers? Uh, as we talk, it would be a virtual teacher at K-5, so uh, much more time to schedule those conversations and meet with students. If multiple teachers schedule their Zoom times and overlap, overlapping blocks, what will happen. And we had that in the spring and we heard parents and students loud and clear. So our principals are doing much more scheduling to make sure that we don't have three Zooms happening at the same time for our sixth grade students. We will have a schedule to make sure that when they are on Zoom, it's not at the same time and that they can attend everything. I wanna talk a little bit about not just K-5, but what does 100% virtual look like for grades six through 12? So we're building that now. The one thing I want to be fair to say is that we can't guarantee that every elective you sign up for, we can teach in a virtual platform. What we can guarantee is every graduation requirement you need, you will be on track. So when we hopefully get back this year or next year, you can get right back on track with those electives. But it does make sense that we have so many students with so many electives at the secondary level, we can't have a virtual teacher teach everything. 
And so definitely all of your core courses, your graduation requirements, we will take care of virtually. And we're working now on having teachers either pick up another section or maybe in their own teaching schedule, they may have four times where they meet with a real hybrid class in one time where they're meeting with their virtual class. We're working on that. But again, all the virtual students, K-12, will be assigned a teacher, not just work online that they have to go and complete. For the virtual elementary, are there set times for students to log in? Um, we're talking about that now. Yes, there will be some set times. Those schedules will come out as we build those uh, schedules and who's in them and exactly who's teaching. Why can't the 100% virtual students get synchronous learning like the hybrid students? They will, based on this new plan we're, we're uh, rolling out, is that they will have a synchronous teacher. And so definitely at the elementary, uh, they will have synchronous learning if they're 100% virtual. And at secondary, what we're saying is it's going to be similar to hybrid. So there'll be at least two synchronous meetings and then three asynchronous lessons, uh, just like a hybrid student would get. Will those who are 100% virtual have daily sessions with the teacher via Zoom as part of this group? Depending on grade level, it may not be daily sessions, but it will be at least two to three a week to make sure that we have that interaction with our virtual students. How will my children get materials during virtual learning? Well, since we're not in an emergency closure, people will be here in buildings. So if we need to get materials and workbooks and textbooks to families, we can either have you pick it up or we can send it if for some reason you can't get into the building, but we'll be able to provide those materials. Will students have the same virtual teacher each week for consistency? Yes, the virtual teachers will be consistent and not, and not moving around. If we choose 100% remote, how does the school district help to remain children's emotional health? And just like with every student, we need that partnership with parents critically. If you see that your child is struggling with anxiety or depression or any sort of emotional health um, issue with COVID or with anything, please make sure you're reaching out to the classroom teacher and especially the administrators are in our incredible mental health teams, including our counselors. Um, please reach out and make sure we're aware so we can work with you as partners to support your child. Has there been any consideration for allowing the 100% virtual students to participate in the already established three day per week virtual instruction? That's a K-5 and yes, we are looking at that. But as I mentioned earlier, at this moment, I can't guarantee it can happen, but we are definitely looking at what we can do. For the virtual model, will a suggested schedule be given to help parents and students organize their work? Yes, we'll have much more, uh, much more scheduled work that we can share with families and with the child through Teams. Will the virtual instruction be from actual teachers or just resources? The virtual instruction will be from actual Penfield teachers. It will not just be a link to a site to go and look things up. This will be much more of a, looking at least like a traditional model of school where they have access to a teacher, they're assigned a teacher, and that work will take place from a Penfield Central School District teacher. Does remote learning have to be done at a certain time? That depends. If there's a synchronous Zoom that's scheduled, then yes, they need to be on. At our K-5 level, we know that not all students may be able to log on by themselves, although we do believe with a little bit of work and training, they can. But if we really get to a situation where a K-5 student doesn't have access and can't get online, anything that's synchronous online for K-5 will be recorded and posted on Teams so the student and the parent could go back and watch that to help the child maybe in after school or at different times. If children do 100% at home, will they be able to participate with their class online? Right now, the answer is Probably not because their online class is their class. So they'll have a virtual teacher. They will have a virtual relationship. They'll be able to learn uh, through that platform of Teams and Zoom. So when we talk about where is their classroom, their classroom is virtual. It's not connected to a real building. If virtual is asynchronous for high school, if a student needs help with homework concepts, what does he need to do? Only see the teacher on Wednesday. So. The virtual, they have um, three days of asynchronous. We're planning for two days of synchronous. They would have the teacher's email. They can definitely check in on Wednesday, but they can also reach out to that teacher any day of the week if they have a question. Um, we also are using Microsoft Teams, which allows the student and the teacher to chat in that safe spot of Microsoft Teams, the classroom. So there are other ways than just waiting for Wednesday to talk with the teacher and find out if you have questions. 
What plans have been put into place for the 100% virtual learning regarding contact time with teachers? Um, we talked about this one in terms of we're building schedules to make sure that contact time with teachers in the virtual students is, is there. What kind of instruction will parents be given to help assist their children at home? Our director of technology and uh, professional development office is working on that now, and we'll be putting out uh, really some online teaching for parents to learn not just the, the common vocabulary, but how to use Teams, how to work with your child in Teams. Right now, your child probably knows how to log into Teams because it's the same way they log into the computers at school. And so, um, you know, we'll encourage you to also log in with your child and see how Teams work, but we'll also provide some online professional development to our parents and guardians to help them. Will the kids in the 100% virtual be grouped with kids in their greater school, or will it be a combination of all elementary schools? This is, this is where we really landed today, is that in order to make this happen, our students in virtual K-5 will be grouped with students from across the district. It will be taught by a Penfield virtual teacher. One of our teachers on staff will be the virtual teacher, but it's very possible that they might be in that virtual class would be students from all four of our elementary schools. And again, it goes back to that very first question about instruction. We're gonna guarantee you the same curriculum based on the same standards and assessments to support learning. And that's our number one focus. I do think as a virtual teacher, you could have a lot of fun building an incredible team of kids who all know they're virtual together. I think that's what we'll be working on. Will the 100% remote students have set times to sign on for class? Yes, they will. Just like our hybrid students, there will be some scheduled times that they should be logging on. Will 100% online learners get any live interaction with their teacher? We've talked about these. Some of these are repeated questions, but yes. Um, how will the 100% virtual kids have a connected experience to their class and school? So it might not be back to their home school, but we are working on how we support those students for the special areas and we'll make sure that that connection is there. So if you attend Indian Landing, but you're a 100% virtual student, you're obviously still an Indian Landing student learning virtual. And we'll obviously, uh, we'll, we're working on a build schedules that incorporate and make sure that students still have that connection. Will students that are 100% virtual have opportunities to interact, present, participate with in-school students and like presentations and speeches? Right now, the answer is if you're virtual, you might be fully virtual, but that's something that we're gonna work on as school opens up and we really start continuing to teach our students both hybrid and virtually, we're gonna be looking for these opportunities to expand our students', um, students uh, unique uh, experiences in these two different platforms. For 100% virtual, how much homework uh, in addition to the two to three hours of schoolwork? This is really grade dependent. You know, our kindergarten students are not gonna have a whole lot of homework beyond the work they're doing online. But when you get up to the high school grades, you're gonna have more homework. We're still working to make sure that students are not online for 12 hours a day, um, but there will be some homework in addition. And uh, that information will come out as we build our schedule. But it would be similar to the times of homework that we have in a traditional school year. For the fully remote elementary option are the synchronous Wednesday activities mandatory. So I don't always like the word mandatory, but everything that we do online is going to be based on attendance. So if you have a scheduled Zoom, whether you're in kindergarten or 12th grade, you should be logging on to that scheduled Zoom because it's like, if you don't, you're missing class. However, we know that because of certain students' uh, schedules and parent work schedules and trying to work from home at K-5, those synchronous online lessons will be recorded and posted. But that means you've got to log into Teams and watch it and complete any work because that's how we're taking attendance. If you never go on Teams for your um, virtual days, you will be marked absent and we don't want that. If my child starts 100% virtual and then in January decides to try hy hybrid, how will the classroom teacher be assigned? And um, really, as we go through this, that's going to be an issue we're going to have to cross in January. But as of now, um, they will either stay with their virtual teacher. If they want to go to hybrid, we would have to schedule them into a real classroom the two days a week, a, a hybrid classroom. So it's similar to uh, if a student moves mid-year. Um, they'll still be being scheduled back into their home school, um, but they would receive another teacher. They, the virtual teacher would shift to the hybrid teacher. 
How will virtual kids get their worksheets and books? We've already mentioned, we'll be able to, to drop those off or have you pick them up or send them in the mail. Will certified teachers teach the virtual classes? Absolutely, lots of guidance, but no change to the fact that schools have to make sure certified teachers are the ones in front of the classroom, whether it be in real time or virtual. Will the kids have the same virtual teacher each week? Yes. These questions I've already answered. I've got some repeats in here, I apologize. So I'm gonna to skip to hybrid. I think we hit most of those virtual questions. Um, the hybrid model, we'll go through some frequently asked questions that came through. And this is where I'm finally gonna get a break from talking and have a sip of water. The question is, could you describe an average day for our students at the elementary, middle, and high school level? So we have principals from all three levels here, and I will turn to um, Dr. Kenny and Mrs. Ware. If you guys could just take a moment and talk about what does that in-person day look like for a student in the hybrid program? Sure, uh, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, a typical day for an elementary student in the hybrid model when they attend school look very similar to a typical day prior to COVID. They'll come into school at normal school hours. Uh, students will have humanities with their classroom teacher for roughly about three hours. Uh, they'll have roughly about an hour of mathematics instruction and then included in the day will be science and social studies also mixed in for roughly an hour. In addition, they'll have lunch and recess which will spend about an hour's worth of time. Uh, throughout the day, they'll also have some social emotional check-ins, which are part of our program anyway. Um, and then trying to think if there's anything else, Marcy, from a program perspective that I'm missing. Uh, but there, go ahead. PE and art. Yes. Yeah, so they'll continue to have specials. Sorry, we're talking over each other. So they'll continue to have specials in person. That will be PE, art, and library uh, while they're attending school. Um, so I think kids will notice that a typical day for them is very similar to what they left in March. Uh, there will be some modifications, but the, the overall ebb and flow will be very similar to a traditional day that we had prior to the COVID closing. Do you want me to explain the day? Sure. So uh, Steve did a great job. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, in terms of when the students are home, uh, they're at home learning days. They you will receive, parents will receive a schedule um, at the beginning of the year that tells exactly what time they would be logging on. So they will have 30 minutes of ELA instruction led by um, a, it's either a literacy specialist or enrichment teacher, depending upon the building. Um, then they'll have 30 minutes of math time led again by a certified teacher doing the math instruction. Um, I think the best way to look at it is every student's being serviced by a team of three teachers, their classroom teacher, and then someone who's doing their virtual learning for ELA, and someone who's leading their virtual learning for math. And that team works very closely together uh, to align their instruction over the course of the week. So the at-home days will have a set time. I know I've had a lot of parents ask me, um, it will be the same time every day uh, for the ELA lessons and the same time every day for the math lessons. They are not necessarily consecutive because we have to take our staff and spread them around. Um, so it might be from 9.30 to 10 for ELA and then 11.15 to 11.45 for math. Um, we've made sure we've built breaks into that schedule. Um, there's time for lunch. Um, we also have music that will be done virtually as well as keyboarding lessons. Um, so they'll have one of the other scheduled for them on each day that they're home. So that's what the Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday would look like when they're home. One um, other thing, Marcy, that we, uh, we forgot to add is that that's when we'll also deliver RTI services to our students too. So that's when a specialist will work uh, with groups of students who are identified who re or who require additional support in mathematics or ELA. And that depends upon the grade level where we offer those services, and it will also depend upon the data. So that time, again, will be the same time every day, but parents will be notified directly by the provider. Uh, that may change throughout the year as our groups change, um, but that would be on those days. And then music lessons, if students have music, instrumental music, those would be scheduled on virtual days as well. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Kenny and Mrs. Ware. Appreciate it. I'll turn it over to Mr. Buddington if you want to talk a little bit about the day in the life of a hybrid student at uh, Patreon. Sure, and I just want to say I know parents listening at home, we're sharing a lot of information with you. If you have further questions as, as you go, please reach out to any administrator. We're happy to continue to answer those questions. Um, at Bay Trail, we've got some things staying the same and some things are going to be quite different. So the, the one of the things that's staying the same is our student day. Um, the building is open at 715 for parent drop-off, for student drop-off. Students will go into the library if they're dropped off beginning at 715. At 7.45, students would be able to go get breakfast till 8 o'clock. Um, for parent drop-off, one of the things that we're, we're looking at for traffic flow is we may be directing traffic that's exiting the drop-off all the way down to the north exit through the Scribner bus loop area, just to give us a little more uh, room to rotate parent traffic. But as Dr. Putnam said, we'll play that um, as it goes with um, the traffic flow that we see. So. Um, students will need to be in their classes at 8.05. One of the biggest changes for Bay Trail is in order to have the consistency of classes and be able to do a hybrid, we've had to change our schedule. So our schedule will be an eight period day with 40 minute periods. Students will have their five core classes a day plus two specials classes, a lunch and a home base during their day. We've added a second lunch, so we've moved home base back up to lunch. So some students will go to lunch and then have home base. Other students will have home base and then go to lunch. We'll be utilizing both our cafeteria and our library for those two different lunches so that we have time to clean each space adequately in between. Um, for band and chorus, those classes for our seventh and eighth graders will meet in the cafeteria because we can have students either six feet apart if the teacher is doing instruction or 12 feet apart if they're playing or singing. For our sixth graders, band and chorus will be in the auditorium. We can do the same thing with the students in the auditorium. The one thing we're not able to offer students is the instrumental music, those students that were in band and also wanted to be in chorus. We, that's a, a challenge that we can't manage with the requirements for the space and the distancing and the cleaning of the spaces. So the students will be scheduled for band or chorus. Um, instrumental music lessons will all be virtual, whether you're in band or orchestra. Our orchestra classes will still meet in the orchestra room. Um, as the students go through their day, they will be rotating classrooms. As we shared earlier, teachers will be cleaning those classrooms in between. Another change, though, is for our special area classes for art, music, PE, and so on. Previously, we crossed house the students in those classes. This year, we'll be scheduling those. So if you're in house A, seventh grade, we're looking at those students will be in art together. We'll have an art class that will be all house A, seventh grade students. The, and, um, as they go through the day, then we'll be when we reach dismissal time at the end of the day. So our eighth period class will not be home base. It will be an instructional period. And at 2.40, we will begin dismissing students at the end of the day. So the student day stays the same. Um, a lot's changing in between. We've removed half the desks from every classroom. So there would be only 13 desks in the classroom. In the cafeteria, we'll be using student desks so that we can have them spaced six feet apart and not our cafeteria tables. So there will be a lot of changes like that that students will experience. But the things of moving and traveling in the hallways, we will have some one-way stairwells. We'll have markings on the floor in the hallway to help kids maintain social distancing. So there'll be some things that are the same at Bay Trail, but there'll also be quite a bit that's different. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Buddington. Dr. Maloney, can you share a little bit about high school? Sure. So at PHS, um, our schedule is staying the same. So the nine period day that students have been familiar with will stay the same. Um, obviously, there will be half the students um, in the classrooms and in the halls. Um, all the classrooms will be set up according to the guidance and the social distancing um, requirements. 
Um, students will be eating in um, the cafeteria in the Commons as they have in the past. The cafeteria, though, will be set up with desks in order to be able to socially distance students during the lunchtime. Um, we need to be able, we need to use desks. The Commons will still have tables um, and it will be indicated where students can um, sit and have lunch. Uh, seniors will still have senior privileges, uh, late arrival and early dismissal, along with um, open lunch. Um, seniors will be able to park on campus, um, and we're thinking that juniors will also be able to park on campus. Um, there will be a, a system for, for students to apply for that. Um, lockers will be a little bit different. Uh, we learned through the closure that not... Uh, Actually, a minority of students use the uh, the lockers, and so we are going to have a request system for students who would like lockers, and that will allow us the opportunity to ensure that the lockers are socially distanced. Um, other high schools use this process, and we're going to um, try that as well. Um, students can have been able to carry their backpacks. Um, they still will be able to carry their backpacks and have their cell phones. One thing that will be new uh, this year is uh, we're very excited. We will be going one-to-one, -one, meaning that students will um, have their own district-issued laptop that they will be using. Uh, so they will bring that with them to school each day. So the, the in-school, in-person day probably will look pretty similar um, to what um, students are familiar with. Obviously, the mask, the social distancing, and 50% uh, of the population there. Uh, PE may look a little different in the sense of students won't uh, be changing, but they will still be doing um, activities and participating in PE. Um, as Mr. Buddington talked about the music courses, our music courses um, will also be in person, um, all of our ensemble groups. Um, the lessons will be on the high, or excuse me, on the virtual days. Um, in terms of what does a, a virtual day look like, um, on Wednesdays, students will participate in their counseling or admin seminars, um, just like they used to on a day five at PHS. There will also be um, a morning show, a specific weekly morning show as opposed to a daily morning show. And then there will be the office hours that students can uh, check in with their teachers. One of the pieces of feedback that we heard loud and clear during the closure was that um, it was difficult for students to know when their teacher was available during Zoom um, or possibly the Zooms uh, overlapped. This will allow for that not to occur and students to have access for that extra support and that extra help on Wednesdays. On the other two virtual days, Students will have um, either flipped lessons, um, could, it could involve um, some type of uh, video to watch, a uh, virtual simulation to do, um, some type of reading. Uh, it will obviously depend on the course and the class. So um, PHS is gonna look a little different, but still a little bit the same. Thank you to all of our, our principals who were able to share a little bit of the day in the life of a hybrid student. Um, moving on, students who have been choosing uh, are going to EMCC. Will that be in the schedule? Yes, if uh, EMCC is a program through BOCES, if you are in that or New Visions, uh, those programs are going to be running and we will transport students. What time will my children need to be logged in on a computer during virtual days? It does depend, but there will be a schedule and you'll know. Uh, how is the high school transitioning between classes and do these cohorts stay together in all classes at the high school? That question really is for um, both Bay Trail and the high school is that students are still going to follow their schedule and move classroom to classroom. Based on the, the number of different levels of courses we teach and electives we have, we can't use the, actually it's an Italian model where the kids stay in one spot and the teachers uh, come to them. Um, so we are going to have to move and be social distant um, in the classroom and then make sure that, again, we're wearing those masks as we transition to classes. And as we talked about earlier, um, desks will be uh, sanitized between each class. 
Um, in the hybrid model, on the days that will be virtual, what will the schedule be? You just heard from uh, our principals at all three levels that talk through what that would look like. If we choose the hybrid model, do students still have the option of asynchronous learning on the virtual days? Uh, yes, they do. Please give an example of asynchronous learning. Just, just briefly, and uh, Mr. Bunnington did a great job at the last three to five, which will be online and you can watch. I'm gonna give us uh, just a quicker one to keep us on track here to get to some other questions people have asked. But basically it involves um, teachers um, you know, creating lesson that they're videotaping themselves and putting online, including the work that is being assigned. So many of our classroom teachers, you know, will teach at the secondary level for maybe 10, 15 minutes or less, really explaining the assignment, explaining the work, and then allowing time for students to do it and then doing a closure activity. So we're really working and we'll be continuing to work between now and the first day of school. So teachers have that ability and understand of what they're putting on. What it's not though, is just a link to a web page to say, go, go read this and without, without any teaching. And that's, it will be, uh, you know, explicit instruction on the asynchronous days. Will they be switching classrooms to attend specials? Yes, uh, students will be switching classes. It's, uh, it is also important at that K-5 level to make sure that students are not stuck in the same classroom the entire time. We talk about mental health and social emotional learning and that ability to get out and move a little bit is also important. And again, we'll sanitize rooms between um, classes. Are teachers allowed to work with small groups of students? Yes, they can but it has to be socially distanced and masks being worn. So it will look different, but of course teachers would be able to work with small groups, but obviously not as close as they were in last, uh, last year, last September, where kids could get real close on a rug and listen to the teacher. Will the resource room, uh, how will the resource rooms be managed? Um, they will be managed both in person and online, just like a hybrid model. I will share now is that our parents and guardians of students with disabilities should have received an email, I believe tonight, if not tomorrow, from Mr. Dreschler, our um, uh, director of special education. And uh, he's going to be hosting uh, three meetings, one for each level, along with the special ed administrator um, at, at those levels to really go through uh, and ask more specific questions around students with disabilities, those with uh, an IEP or 504. So um, please look out for those meetings. And with those questions, I encourage you to please um, attend or if you can't, to reach out to your building level special education administrator. Will kids be able to leave desk supplies in their desks at school or will they need to be brought home? I learned from our earlier elementary principals is that they all purchased bins. So students won't be leaving things in their desk. They'll have a bin assigned to them where they'll keep their supplies. I'll look at Dr. Kenny and Mrs. Ware. Is that accurate for, for Cobbles in the Landing too? Yes. Awesome, thank you. What will be taught on the home days? Is it new material or just reinforcing material? As you heard from all of our principals, our content and our instruction needs to continue on the virtual days. So those days will not just be reviewed, they will be new instruction, asynchronous through sixth grade through 12th grade, synchronous at the K-5 level, and uh, it will be new content. What's the plan to support these students that need support for the at-home learning days? This is where the partnership of parents and school is going to be critical. We always appreciate that partnership. And obviously with what we are living under with COVID, it's gonna be even more important. So if you are struggling, your child is struggling on those virtual days, we ask that you reach out to the classroom teacher, administrator, mental health staff, like our counselors to make sure we're aware and we can do um, partnering to make sure that we can support your child. Are both cohorts on the same academic schedule, exams, homework, do the same time? I think this really, um, Dr. Maloney, can you answer this one? I know you did before and I don't wanna, I don't wanna mistake this. Sure, so the question, um, are both cohorts on the same academic schedule? Um, in some, inst I feel badly because the answer is yes and the answer is no. Um, so students will, have um, in-person, so let me back up a little bit. Um, those of you that are familiar with our schedule, we run a five-day rotation, nine periods a day, and then a five-day rotation. So students um, in cohort A and B, um, if they are in-person days one and days two, uh, cohort B will also be in-person days one and days two. 
In terms of the um, exams and homework due to the same time, when we map that out according to the school calendar, there are some, the way that it falls, there are some instances where exams and homework could be due at the same time. And then there are instances where um, they may um, fall out of sync. So um, that's where the answer falls in terms of yes and no. Thank you. I lost my document. Hang on one second. Here we go. All right. If the district uh, is able to instruct core A on Thursday, the 10th, and B the next day, how come we can't do half days for all students five days a week? Great question. Um, we looked at all opportunities for hybrid, including half days. And transportation uh, uh, is, a, is obviously the first sort of um, variable that becomes an issue because it would be picking up students and running routes to bring in the school and home twice a day. But we also really uh, looked at the research we did just about seven years ago when Penfield went from half day K to full day K. And the reality is um, the half day program, by the time students get in, get to their class, and then have to pack up to leave, um, the amount of instructional time is very, very limited both at K-5, but especially at the 6-12 levels, um, where right now classes are going to be 40 minutes. You're talking about classes being less than 20 minutes um, if you are on a half day. So we definitely looked at that. There is one local school district that's doing half day K-5, and we realized that anything that we put forth is not going to be perfect for every family and every student. We want to, again, just acknowledge those frustrations that we'd love to come back full time, five days a week, all students right now under the current guidance and the realities of COVID, that's not possible. But we definitely looked into this option as well. Explain how cohorts were determined and where were the cohorts broken up by neighborhood and can we change cohorts? So actually we utilized our infinite campus student management system that offered a new tool to be able to truly randomize a split of students. Many districts, including us, started looking at using an alpha split, which creates some issues um, on all different variables, including um, um, ethnic ethnicities, diversity, gender, and so by actually using this fully random split, we have much more uh, equitable groups in A and B. And so um, uh, th that we use Infinite Campus. The one variable we were able to put in in control, though, is households. We want to make sure that students in the same household, same family, regardless of last name, living together, or would be together in the same cohort for consistency purposes. And that really was the focus. We didn't use um, neighborhoods. And to be honest, with the number of neighborhoods we have, the system wouldn't let us use neighborhoods as a decision factor in cohorting. But I also want to be really honest and, and transparent with this, is that this district, thanks to our school board, has been devoted around equity and equality and trying to make sure that, that we are focused on that. By using neighborhoods as a cohort grouping, it would be helpful, we understand, because you'd be going to school, all the kids in the same neighborhood would go to school, but we would immediately have an issue with, um, with that equity piece, because based on the neighborhoods in Penfield, it, could, it would quickly fall down the line of a socioeconomic issue. And so I want to be honest that, one, we can't do it based on the system and the number of neighborhoods, but also um, the concern we would have is around splitting by neighborhood would become very quickly a socioeconomic um, equitable issue. And so I want to address that because I have received that question a number of times. Can we change cohorts? The answer right now is no. We built a list. If you really feel like you need to change a cohort, I ask that you email your building principal. We're monitoring those. But right now, for every change, there is a major reaction, such as if, if a student goes from A to B, based on our social distance programs right now, we have to make sure that somebody from B goes to A in the exact same grade level at the exact same school. And so right now, we're keeping a list. We're monitoring that. But currently, we can't make changes. This is aligned to most of the districts in Monroe County. As they have created their cohorts, there's not a lot of room for change. I know that's difficult. Um, and again, we're monitoring those. If we can, as the school year starts, make some changes, we will reach out to those families. But again, 
um, that is a very difficult situation with our schedule and really having to build it based on the cohorts we have now. Why won't children be allowed to play on the playground and equipment um, during the start of the year? It really comes down to our playgrounds at the elementary be closed at the beginning of the year for recess. We'll still have recess. Students will still be outside. We'll be doing some organized play with those students, make sure that they have that downtime. We're hopeful that we'll be able to open playgrounds, but just like the mask wearing and all the things we're doing, we're starting with a very cautious approach the school year. And as we progress into the school year, hopefully we said uh, things will change for the better and we can start opening up things more, including the playground. But for right now, we're gonna hold off on use of playground. We cannot sanitize it in time between each group coming out. Will kids have access to lockers? The, this was addressed a little bit with the hallway lockers. And at this point, um, Bay Trail and PHS, Mr. Buddington, can you correct me? I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't remember off the top of my head what the answer was. Yeah, and Dr. Maloney reminded me, it's one of the things I forgot to mention. Um, because we know lockers are often an issue for students, we are going to be allowing students to carry backpacks this year. And so we are going to delay our assigning to lockers assignment of lockers at Bay Trail. So students will start the year without a locker assignment. As we get into the year, um, we will be assigning lockers to students so, and we will space them out from group A and group B. Um, but we want to let everybody know that to start the year, students and students can carry backpacks all year. So um, we wanted to remove some, something that we know stresses out a lot of kids, especially sixth graders coming into Bay Trail. So we won't be assigning lockers right at the beginning of the year. In terms of, did you want, in terms of yeah. PE? Yeah, um, just for PE. So, in, I believe this is true at both PHS and Bay Trail. Um, our K-12 uh, department chair for PE and health has um, worked with the PE, PE teachers to design a curriculum that um, students will not need to change. Um, locker rooms present um, a whole new host of situations relative to um, social distancing and mask wearing. So uh, students will not need to change for PE, and but yet they will still be doing some, um, some of the same fun activities that they have done in the past, as well as some, some uh, new uh, socially distanced um, activities. Thank you. Uh, where will kids eat lunch? That depends on what school you're going to, but right now I can share that based on construction that's currently taking place, Scribner and uh, Indian Landing will be having lunch in classrooms and that was actually planned because of the construction. As we move to um, Harris Hill and Cobbles, they've found a way to be able to use their cafeteria but be socially distant. And I believe Mr. Buddington and Dr. Maloney shared when they talked about the day in the life is that they'll be eating in the cafeteria um, at their schools. Will my child be allowed to bring their lunch? Absolutely, we encourage it. Our food services will be providing a hot option and a cold option every day but lunches will be much more limited. We won't be providing snacks, so the vending machines at the high school are being removed, and that really fun snack shack at Bay Trail with the slushies, unfortunately, will not be open as we start. We won't be doing as many of the snacks and the ice cream treats and stuff simply to limit the number of students coming into the, into the lunch line into the cafeteria. And so um, we will be offering a lunch, one hot, one cold, less options, so you're absolutely encouraged and you can bring a lunch just like a regular year. Some general reopening questions. Um, we talked a little bit about PE it will take place both virtual and in real time. Um, the high school in Bay Trail in eighth grade have um, some students take living environment. Those have labs. And just uh, to talk through this quickly is that all of those labs will still happen. The virtual students will be doing online labs. There's lots of ways to do that. And for our hybrid students, there'll be a mix of some real in-person labs and some online as well. I wanna talk a little bit about grading feedback um, because in the emergency closure, we moved like all districts around us to a pass incomplete. 
We realize that we're running into a lot of issues of trying to do online learning as an emergency situation. This fall is gonna be different. Students will have assignments, they will get feedback, they will get grades, and that at the end of that 10 weeks, they will receive a report card uh, grade from sixth grade to 12th grade. It's a numeric grade like we traditionally used and in the elementary school, they'll be doing the report cards, which are more standards based at the elementary level but it's gonna be much more traditional. So students will have to stay on track of their work. Parents will be supporting that, but um, I wanna, I know we're getting a lot of questions about is grading gonna be the same as it was in the spring? And the answer is no, it'll look much more traditional than it did a year and a half ago, a year ago. Um, how will attendance be taken? It will be taken in class for hybrid, and then it's gonna be taken through Microsoft Teams, um, Microsoft Office Teams when you get on Teams and you submit the work that's there, and uh, that's how we're taking attendance. So it's gonna be really important that students are logging in and doing the work assigned. For both models, what's the instructional plan for children with IEPs that don't fall into a 12-1-1 or a 12-1-3-1 class? And it really is a very specific question because it's that individualized education plan. So I encourage parents um, of students with disabilities to attend the meeting to get an email about with Scott Dreschler and our special education administrators and do not hesitate to reach out to the building principal and or the special education administrator with specific questions to make sure, but we are committed to supporting all of the IEPs that we have and make sure students get what they, um, what they require. I'm gonna go through a couple more of these. We did more in the first one, but I wanna make sure we have time to answer questions at the end as well. We are uh, working on schedules and supply lists. So schedules and supply lists are coming. Batrail was able to get their supply list out yesterday for our middle school families. And our elementary schools and our high school are in the work of finalizing that and trying to go through and make sure that, you know, obviously students are not gonna be able to share supplies as much as they did before, but also making those modifications and we'll get those out as soon as possible. Please look for an email from your building principal. And then schedules, we're gonna really have to ask for patience here because we're trying to build these schedules and in a much different world. And so typically this is the time of year, especially for our K-5 where they're getting their teacher and they're getting their assignments and maybe they're starting to get their high school schedules. It's good, it might take a little bit more time to do that. Please be patient. And as soon as we can, we will contact families through our portal and email to let you know schedules are available. Um, how will the district work with the urban suburban program and students to ensure their academic, social, emotional needs are being built, are being uh, being met? Our students in the urban suburban program are 100% Penfield students, so everything that's offered to a Penfield student is there too. So if they need technology, we'll get them technology. If they need additional support, they'll reach out and should reach out to their building principal, school, child's counselor to work through any needs they may have. Are there options for childcare through YMCA? What about partnering with Penfield Rec? Right now in Penfield Rec, we don't have a plan. I am gonna be looking into that. It's a great question that came up. The YMCA I can share is gonna be offering a program um, for their um, for people to be able to actually drop their, their children off on the virtual days. There will be a cost for that set by the YMCA. Information for that should be coming out next week from the YMCA. They're a great partner with us and they saw this as a need and built the program. So we thank them for that and families uh, might be able to use that. Keep an eye out for an email. If my child chooses hybrid and then wants to switch, uh, is that possible? The answer is when you fill out that survey, uh, selecting hybrid or virtual, it really is for the first semester. And that's because of scheduling. You heard tonight that we're looking at um, hiring within our virtual teachers to teach classes virtually. So if we had 100 students want to leave hybrid to go to virtual, we wouldn't have enough staff overnight to do that. Same as if you're in virtual and 100 students want to come back hybrid, we can't do that overnight because of the social distancing regulations. But I will say as a district, we're committed to working with you. If after school starts, you want to change the format, you're going to reach out to your building principal. We'll have a process and we will do everything we can to make that switch. I just can't guarantee that it's going to be seamless. Like if you ask us on a Friday, we'll be able to do it by Monday. It might take time. And at some points, we not, might not be able to guarantee it. Do you have any concerns over the teachers union calling for 100% remote learning or delayed start? Um, and I'm going to add to this a question that just came through. Do I have any concerns that the Rochester City School District just announced that they're going fully virtual for the first 10 weeks of school? 
I don't have any concerns. We have a number of collective bargaining groups in this district. They are wonderful to work with. They're incredibly committed professionals. They, uh, um, members of their unions um, met with us during the reopening task force days. Um, and, and while many people have different levels of anxiety about returning and questions, just like parents do, um, I know that at the end of the day, we want what's best, which is at some point a return to school. And so I don't have concerns right now about a delayed start or, or having to shift to completely hybrid, but we do have a plan to shift online if we have to. Our plan right now, so you're aware, is that if we have to shift online overnight because the governor or the Department of Health tells us that's what's required, that we will, at least for the beginning, use our hybrid model, but online. So on those two in-person days, students will be logging on to work with their teacher and then the other days would be asynchronous or they'd be working with the reading, math uh, specialists and enrichment teachers at the elementary level. It might not stay like that. We might be able to build into a more robust synchronous daily lesson schedule, but we wanna make sure that we have a plan in place that we can turn on very quickly. And that would be keeping the same hybrid model, but shifting it completely virtual, at least to start. And that's something we've continued to talk about. Orientations, will there be orientations for kindergartners, sixth graders, ninth graders? And the answer to that is no orientations, but you will be hearing from your building principals about a time for kindergartners to come in and meet their teacher and see the classroom as an appointment only with their parent or guardian. And so you'll hear about that. We'll be doing that the first six days of school when teachers are here and students are not. And at sixth grade and ninth grade, students will be able to come in uh, scheduled to walk their schedule, see the building. And if their schedules aren't available yet, they'll still be able to come in, see the building, see where the different department classes are at Bay Trail, see, look, see what house A, B, and C look like. So we are gonna have an opportunity. We heard parents loud and clear that they really wanted that orientation. And while we can't do a traditional orientation where we put 400 students in an auditorium, we are gonna find a way to get them into the building and so they can feel a little bit less anxiety about a new start. Uh, kindergarten assessments are required. They will be done social distancing, mask wearing as school starts up. Are students gonna be able to participate in sports clubs and extracurricular activities? And the answer to that is right now, athletics are on hold by the state. They won't start, if they do start, it won't be until the third week of September. Our clubs and extracurricular activities are not going to be meeting after school in uh, in, uh, in classrooms, but we do have a form that's going to be going out to all of our typical advisors that they may be able to fill out to do a virtual club or extracurricular activity. And one of that is we want it to be synchronous. So if they can set up through teams, a synchronous club and really have kids in and interacting with other students in that club, um, we're going to be looking at making some approvals for those, but it won't be that traditional after school club. Technology, lots of questions are coming in now online. We appreciate that. Um, will laptops be provided to all Penfield Central School District students? The really easy answer is yes. We are moving rapidly to a one-to-one -one district where every student will have a device that they will be able to bring home and bring school and will be theirs to work on. The slightly longer answer is we know and we knew and we shared this via email a couple of times now that there would be supply chain delays and uh, we don't think we're going to have all of the computers we ordered uh, when school starts in September. But in a conversation today, we're feeling very confident that we'll have them um, by mid-October. So as you fill out that survey about needing a computer, we do have a large number of computers that we use in school and that we can loan to students. But what we're asking is if you can make it to mid-October with the devices you have in your house, that would be great. But if you truly need one, then please put into the survey that you do. Uh, knowing that if you can make it to mid-October, um, with what you currently have, we appreciate that. But again, um, we wanna uh, make sure that as we go virtual and hybrid, we wanna make sure that students have access to what they need. How does the district handle two students who need to sign at the same time on one computer? If you're a family with multiple children and you only have one computer that works, I'd ask you to, to fill out the survey saying you need an additional computer um, because we wanna make sure that students can log in if there are Zooms at the same time with other siblings in the household. The other piece that just came through as a question is what about hotspots? 
That survey also asks if you have internet at your home. If you don't, please let us know. We do have uh, some limited mobile hotspots we'll be able to offer to families that do not have wireless in their home. Uh, what technology should we have at home? I can share with you that we buy Lenovo's or Dell's uh, Windows 10 operation systems and Pentium processors uh, that we'll be sharing, but just about any device that has internet access can work to get onto Microsoft Office Teams. If you use a Macintosh or an iPad, there is through the app, a um, you can purchase the Microsoft Office app and it works really well. There's a few things you can't um, use on it, but very minimal it won't impact schoolwork. Um, will all the work be done in Teams? Yes. Will they have to print things out from home? Absolutely not. We heard you loud and clear in the spring, and we are not going to be any, any home printing to take place. And because students are in hybrid or because our staff will be in the building for our virtual kids, anybody that needs a packet or something will be able to either give to the students to bring home, mail home, or have you come and pick up. Has the proper training for teachers been, been given? Are you confident teachers will be successful? Yes, I'm very confident that our teachers are gonna be successful. We have had some online training all summer. We'll be with teachers officially six days before student starts with more professional development. And uh, we have been using teams rapidly all summer long. So I am very confident of our incredible staff and their ability to transition to a hybrid and or a fully virtual model. Uh, will each student get a login credentials prior to the first day? If you go ask your child right now, they probably know how to log on the Teams. It's the same way they log on to the computer when they're in school. Our youngest kids, absolutely, we will find a way to share that information, especially if you're 100% virtual. And if you don't, if your child doesn't know how to log into Teams, um, now you can reach out to the building principal, let us know, and, and we'll get you the credentials to log in, or you can wait and we'll be sharing that information. Will classrooms be equipped with a camera for live streaming? They will not. We will not have cameras in the classroom. We have we really have learned through the summer and looking at educational research of having a teacher try to teach 12 students and have 12 watching from home at the same time uh, does not work well instructionally. And so um, there won't be cameras for live streaming in the classroom. And now we have time for uh, some new questions and answers. And so um, I have them and been watching as they've been coming in this evening. Um, we've got a lot. I'm not going to be able to get through all of them. I won't read the ones that we've already answered somewhere in this presentation. Um, but the um, so some of these have been asked. I apologize. Let's see. Will student be assigned a teacher with 100% virtual? And the answer is yes. We talked about that uh, uh, students will be assigned teachers if they're in the 100% virtual model. It will be an official teacher tied to them. Is there a way to have individual meetings early in the year between parents and teachers to discuss the needs of students and ways to support each other? Absolutely. So that process of having team meetings and teacher meetings with a parent. And as we get into K-5, where we have parent-teacher conference days, um, it'll probably be though that those meetings most likely will take place on Zoom. We'll probably do more distance virtual meetings for that. But if there are times where a parent truly needs to meet with us, you would call the building principal, uh, the school or the teacher to schedule a time. But the schools, uh, based on that recommendation from the Department of Health, are really going to be limiting outside visitors to our school. So presenters and even parents. So one of the things we didn't talk about here, but that came up is, is lunch. K-5, we have a wonderful opportunity typically to have parents come in and eat lunch with their children. That is not an option this year to limit um, visitors into the school. So again, we can definitely have meetings, but most likely they'll take place on, uh, on a platform like Zoom. Will the chat function for Office 365 be turned off for students? It was a major distraction for students and kids would send links to other children that were not school related. Thank you. Yes, because we are turning off the chat feature. They'll still be able to chat with students in their class and their teacher, but they won't have the opportunity to chat with everybody on Teams, which would be any other student in our district. And um, we did leave that on at the end of the year because of some social emotional needs of making sure students had a ability to chat. 
but it is not monitored. Um, and we really talked to some parents who felt that they thought it was monitored because it was through the Microsoft Office Teams platform the school is using. So that platform will be turned off if it's not turned off already. And um, as we go into the school year, they'll be able to chat with their kids in their class and with their teacher, but not everybody else. We talked about in-place uh, orientations and personal orientations. While we're not doing the, the full orientation, we will be working to bring those transition students, K, six, and nine into the building. Will desks be disinfected between each student? Yes, they will. Oh, so here's a one that's important because maybe the superintendent also has an eighth grade son. Will the trip to DC be an option uh, either this year in eighth grade or for our students last year in eighth grade who did not get the trip? And the answer is right now, all field trips are put on hold. So we will not be doing field trips small locally. And at this point, the DC trip is, is on hold. The way things are going, I wanna be honest and transparent, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do the DC trip. It takes a lot of planning that usually happens now and with all the unknowns in the world we have right now, we don't want to have students go out right now fundraising for a trip that might not happen. The eighth grade trip last year is not going to happen as they go into ninth grade. One, because we do not know about any sort of travel outside of the state or even locally at this point. And um, we did work and Mr. Bunnington's on. I do believe there is a plan for the students who had funds that they raised are those funds being transferred to the high school so they'll follow the student? I see nodding, so I think I'm good. So the any student that did fundraising and had a fundraising balance, those funds were transferred to PHS for that student to have access to at PHS. I'll let Dr. Maloney talk about what things those funds might be used for. Thank you. A question that comes up, uh, students often get sick and it's not COVID. If I keep my child home out of an abundance of caution with cold or flu-like symptoms, will they be able to get instruction materials for the person uh, in-person days they miss? And yes, if your child stays home because they're ill for whatever reason, if you've got uh, um, um, really bad seasonal allergies or whatever it might be and you keep your child home and you know what it is, Obviously, we encourage you to reach out to your uh, pediatrician or urgent care uh, to make sure that it's not COVID. But at the end of the day, um, if you keep your child home and they need to get work, the answer is yes. Right, you know, right now, we do the same thing. In a traditional year, if a child is home sick, they're able to get work, and we'll do the same thing um, in this process as well. The fact that teachers will be using Microsoft Teams as a single platform, it's possible that the work will already be up and that you won't have to come into school to pick anything up, but they'll have work that they can do. Um, so so very similar to the school year. Can't help myself, let's read this comment. Thanks so much for all of your work over these last few months. I feel confident that my children will be safe this fall. I appreciate that it's a team effort. Everybody here in the thousand staff members we have, as well as our incredible parents out there, thank you. It is a team effort. We do take this seriously. Will the remote option provide additional help with reading? My child just entered and um, and, and, and and needs maybe reading support. So yes, we will find a way. I can't tell you exactly what it looks like now, but our students that are 100% virtual will have that still opportunity to get small group instruction. It may be taught by the 100% virtual teacher who might be meeting with students in smaller groups to do different tiered levels of intervention, um, but we will be able to provide that extra support for students even if they are 100% virtual. One of the questions is how are we going to um, how are we going to make sure that students have uh, socially distant in the hallway? And the answer is we're not going to be fully socially distant in the hallway in between classes at the secondary level. But that's why again masks are being required because whenever we can't be six feet apart, we have to wear masks. And so in the hallway, we might not be six feet apart, but everybody will wear masks. There is sign, uh, signs going up and buildings are looking at their traffic patterns. So for our buildings that have different levels, um, you know, first and second floors, um, there might be very possible that some staircases are only up and others are only down to try to make sure that that um, traffic jam and congestion in those staircases doesn't happen. 
what is a cohort? I have no idea what that is, and I haven't heard about it until tonight. So we've thrown out a lot of words like cohort, and cohort really is just another way to say for us, group A and group B. If your child's attending Monday and Tuesday, they're in cohort A, and if they're attending Thursday, Friday in the hybrid, they're co cohort B. Will Bay Trail families be given a choice of band or chorus if they had previously choos chosen both, or will it be random? Mr. Buddington, can you answer that one? I can. Um, so we are very fortunate in Penfield that we have a wonderful music program. We have over 110 students at each grade level who select only chorus. We also have close to that number that select band and orchestra. So the students that were in band or orchestra and did instrumental chorus, they'll be scheduled in their band or chorus classes. The students that were just in chorus will be the ones in chorus. Unfortunately, we can't give people that opportunity of choice at this time, just simply because of the numbers of students that we have in each, in each program and the social distancing requirements that we have. Thank you. Will the 100% virtual elementary students still be able to continue with instrumental band lessons? And so um, I'm seeing some nodding from our elementary principals. When it comes to lessons, we'll be able to do those through Zoom. We'll figure it out. But 100% virtual students, um, because at K-5, all music is going to be virtual, I think that we'll be able to um, make sure that we can fit that into schedules. Um, how big will the 100% virtual class be? Will there be no more than 20 students per, per virtual teacher like the elementary level? Um, I don't know, we'll have to look at that. If our grade levels virtually are large, uh, more, than, more than 30 students will be splitting them up. Um, ideally, we know that lar trying to teach large groups of people through Zoom or Teams is not practical and not good instructional practice. So depending on how many students are virtual and how many teachers we need, it may be that they are not meeting every single day, but doing um, synchronous some days and asynchronous the other, or it's possible that the virtual teacher might meet with half of the um, class in the morning and the other half in the afternoon, because we're looking at about two to three hours of, of work in the virtual world, two to three hours of online learning. So that's a great question that we're still building. Will LOAT be taught at Bay Trail this year? I just feel like picking on Mr. Buddington. These are all yours, Mr. Buddington. Can you talk a little bit about LOAT at Bay Trail? Yeah, so um, LOAT will be taught in seventh and eighth grade. Um, it is a credit-bearing class for students. So it will be our fifth core for seventh and eighth grade. However, because of that, we're not able to run our world of language classes in sixth grade. The sixth grade world of language class is not a state required class. And by having the low teachers aligned with the core teachers teaching seventh and eighth grade, they're not available for the specials periods in sixth grade when typically world of language would be. So low classes will still be scheduled for seventh and eighth grade. They will meet as a regular core class. They'll meet if you're group A, they'll meet both, both days, Monday and Tuesday, if you're group B, They'll meet both Thursday and Friday, and then they'll have asynchronous lessons the opposite time. Thank you. Well, one of the questions that came up with is really good, and I apologize, but it's too late now, is if we could have each introduced ourselves and the role in your school because it's an incoming kindergarten family. I apologize we didn't do that, but in the interest of time, we just tried to answer the questions as they came uh, through. But as a, so welcome to any incoming brand new families of, of kindergartners who have never been uh, in the Penfield School District, please reach out to your building principal uh, if you have any questions around kindergartners coming in. And uh, um, obviously we welcome you here to the district. Thank you very, very much. Will the 100% virtual students have class meetings, group contact with other students in their virtual classroom? Absolutely. As I talk through and we talk about synchronous instruction, yes, it will be a class, but it would be online. So they'll definitely have interaction with other students. They'll be able to use the classroom chat and team to talk with other students and build those great classroom relationships. They'll just be doing it in a virtual world. 
Most of our students and children know how to do that. If they play Minecraft, they're probably living in a virtual world already and having a great time with it. And I think that um, they will still build great connections even though they'll be virtual. What if I only have one computer, but two children on remote days? If you are unable, like we ask you to fill out the survey. If you need one, please put it in. But we're encouraging you that if you can make it to mid-October, we appreciate it because we want to make sure that we can give them to everybody. Dr. Maloney mentioned earlier that the plan is for grade 8 to 12 to be given a computer for rollout in September. That is our plan still, but it's going to also depend on how many requests we get for computers across K through 7. So we're working on a plan. Our director of technology, Jason DeLorenz, is incredible, has multiple plans in the hopper to make sure that we can support all families in a number of ways with technology. Will teachers be able to move about the room and help students when there are questions? Um, absolutely. Uh, it is the six foot distance um, or mask. And even though we're requiring them, yes, teachers will still be able to move around and help students. Um, again, it's gonna look a little different. They probably won't be sitting side by side very close, but they will be able to move around and help students and work in small groups. I, I want to say a great question that we've gotten a couple times here is what will um, special education services look like in the 100% virtual model? And we are we are really dedicated to building that. It, we want to make sure, obviously, that any special education service is, is required and we will meet that IEP's needs. And I would ask you that if you're looking at 100% virtual, that you attend the special education parent meetings with the SEAs and Scott Dresser that are taking place on Zoom um, next week. And we'll have more information to share. Um, we have a question, and I think it's, it, even though we talked about it, I'm gonna bring it up again, which is why are students being forced to wear masks when they're sitting at desks placed six feet apart? Emotional stress and daily struggle is, is gonna be difficult on students. I, wa I wanna answer this question because we talk a lot in this district about resiliency. It's one of the core beliefs under social emotional learning. And this is an opportunity for us to really think and take a step back around the resiliency that our students are gonna learn in this world. COVID's a reality, we can't change that. We don't wanna do hybrid or virtual. We wanna be in school full time. We know we can't based on all that guidance in the rules and regulations that we are forced to follow. But at the end of the day, and maybe it's my curse, I will always find a silver lining. And the silver lining in this is that if we can partner together as a community parents and schools to really focus on the resiliency that our students will learn through this process. Will it be difficult? Will it be some uncomfortable conversations? Absolutely. Is it gonna be perfect and, and seamless? It won't. It's gonna be a little messy as we try to build this and continue to go. But we are committed. We know our families and students are committed. And truly, or my hope is that 10 years from now, our students look back and realize that they got through a year of COVID in their school and were successful they'll be able to conquer any college course that's thrown at them or any difficult work situation because they made it through this. And, and I say that as a superintendent, but also as a parent of, of, of three boys, two of them school age, lots of conversations in our house about the resiliency and trying to find the silver linings. This is a mindset conversation. We don't like this. We don't want to do this, but we know we have to. And can we find a way to work together to be positive with it? I think I did mention, but just to make sure, is there gonna be before and after school assistance, uh, the YMCA program? The YMCA programs are gonna run um, and uh, before and after they have an approved plan uh, that, that meets the social distancing and masking requirements. And so we're able to offer that to our families. Um, I don't know if the question is asking about financial assistance. I know that's come up. That would be through the YMCA. The school district doesn't have a program, but um, that would be a YMCA conversation. If a child received speech therapy in school last year without an IEP, will that still be available this year only for hybrid or remote? So there are some um, uh, speech acquisition programs we do that are not IEP related, 
we are working through that. We are, you know, planning to still offer um, speech, uh, obviously, to our students and IEPs, absolutely. And this district goes uh, far above and beyond. We have incredible speech language pathologists here, and that's something that we're, we're trying and working to to make sure that those are in those schedules. So I apologize for the silence, but trying to read all of your great comments as I go through is takes a little time here. What happens if a child takes their mask off and doesn't want to put it back on? Just with everything, we would have conversations with the child. Uh, hopefully they would put their mask on when talking with the teacher and then it would go through the process of probably talking to the building administrator and, and having to call parents. We'll wanna, we want to obviously at our youngest levels, make sure we're working with students. We know it's gonna be a struggle. We know it's different. It's definitely a new normal. If I'm virtual, if my child's virtual, will they still get music lessons like Suzuki? I believe right now our plan is even Suzuki lessons, they will be virtual, um, but we will be working to schedule those, whether it's hybrid or 100% virtual. What is the latest update about after school sports? Any hope for homecoming? So I'll never give up hope, but right now there are no sports based on New York State until the third week of September, which means no homecoming. Um, and so as soon as anything changes, if sports open up, we will communicate that. But I think to be fair, I, I don't see how we put 2,000 people in the stands in the end of September for homecoming. So I am sure that Dr. Maloney and the incredible team at the high school will still find a way to celebrate somehow. And that goes to the other question, actually a question directed at Indian Landing, but I think is for everybody is um, Indian Landing, like many of our schools, does things like student of the month. Will we still find ways to celebrate student of the month? We won't be able to do large scale assemblies, but will we still celebrate student success? And I'll answer for the principals, yes. We'll find a way to still encourage and engage and celebrate the wonderful students here in Penfield, even though it might look different than it did last year in a big, in a, in a, in a big gathering. I think we talked about last time, but not this time. The question is around, I have a senior and that senior's watching right now and wants to know, will they have senior privileges? So Dr. Maloney, you wanna talk a little bit about senior privileges like parking on campus, late arrival, early dismissal and the ever famous open lunch. So I know better than to take away senior privileges. There will still be senior privileges. Um, there will still be uh, early dismissal, late arrival, parking on campus, and open lunch. Thank you. And I know some questions came up around open lunch because it does mean students are leaving campus and interacting with others and coming back. We've had a number of conversations about that as well as with health officials. And ultimately, parents are still going to be able to come and pick up their child to bring them to an appointment and then return them back to school. I cannot um, eliminate all risk. And the fact is when students leave school, we don't have control on the interactions they're having um, in the community or with other people. So while open lunch absolutely does allow for that, we'll also be working with the Department of Health for all contact tracing. Dr. Maloney? And um, Dr. Putnam, to that point, um, students come and go uh, from the high school all day. Um, we have students who go to both these programs um, we have students who um, go to other programs and come in. So um, you had mentioned in the earlier session, doctor's appointments, uh, dentist appointments. So um, yeah, students will still be coming and going. Thank you. So it is um, right on 9 p.m. and we're gonna stick to that two hour time frame. So just some quick closing remarks. I wanted to say thank you again to our incredible Board of Education. Um, they are fully volunteer. So they spend a lot of time and it is a full volunteer job, which actually, thanks to COVID, has really become a second full-time job for all of you. So thank you very much for your commitment to the district and supporting the work and listening to families and parents and staff. Um, and I want to say thank you to our administration, but also um, a thank you to the people who aren't here. Um, we invited everybody, but we 
knew that not everybody would be able to come because we have to schedule these in a way that would be, work best for families. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for watching. And just also a, a great thank you and gratitude to the just under 1,000 staff members from every role, regardless of your title, um, they, you, you truly the work you're doing to make sure that we can open safe and supportive for our students is just critical work. And, and I can't thank you enough, both as a superintendent and as a father of boys that attend this district. Um, and finally, in the closing remarks is we do have one more upcoming community meeting officially right now. That's Thursday, August 20th, next week from 4 to 6 p.m. That one, we will not follow this format. We won't be answering the same questions. We'll be answering new questions that are less focused around hybrid and virtual and, and maybe do a little bit more open back and forth with questions in the community. So we want to make sure we had a couple already scheduled that maybe help parents with the selection of hybrid and virtual. And hopefully that this has been helpful for you. If uh, you have other questions or concerns, don't hesitate to email out specifically your building principal. If it's a building question, you can email my office as well, and uh, we'll work to make sure we have answers. The other last piece is that we are updating our FAQ document. It's a little delayed to a, to a technical issue. It will be updated uh, early next week with all of the questions that we presented here and any more that have come in. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and we will uh, sign off from Penfield. Thank you.